Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming along this evening. Uh, I'm David Eustace, I'm the Chancellor of the University. One of my main roles is to host the graduation ceremonies as titular head of the university, but one of the other roles I've taken on is to host these evenings. Uh, this is the third in the series of the Chancellor's Talk series, and the aims of the talk are basically to bring to an audience people who have achieved, pushed, tried, and gone beyond what we would most regard as normal. They've pushed ourselves as far as they can go. And to give you guys the opportunity to hear their stories, meet them, and ask questions of them. We launched the talks last year uh, with legendary graphic artist and designer Milton Glazer, who is not necessarily a household name, but Milton is the author and curator uh, of the I Heart NY logo. It's probably the most recognisable logo in the world. And we followed this up uh, later with Jeremy Thomas, who is the UK's greatest independent film producer. At 38, Jeremy won an Oscar for making, making the movie The Last Emperor, went on to do things like Sexy Beast, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, Rabbit Proof Fence, Crash, Naked Lunch. His, his list really does go on and on. Uh, tonight, we are joined by another incredible mind. Uh, someone who, when you, you hear the story, it just inspires you. Tonight, we're joined by the British polar explorer, Anne Daniels. And I hope each of you leave tonight with something that might just lift you, something that may just make you think, I'm going to go for this, I'm going to try it. Uh, there's certain things I've got to do, the growing up bit. One is there is no scheduled fire alarm to go tonight. So if you see me screaming, running out the door, please follow me as fast as you can. Uh, but the staff are there, so if we can keep it in a calm manner. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. The second thing is a bugbear of mine, and I'm sure for many it's the same. Can I ask you to please either switch off your phones or put them to silent? There's nothing worse. And, and for yourself, there's nothing more embarrassing if your phone goes, even if it's an accident. So this is, you know, the thing, if we can put that off. The other great thing tonight is there's a chance to stand and talk and share a drink with Anne. We're going to meet downstairs after this. And we're going to, Anne's going to give her, her talk. We're going to have a, a Q&A session. Uh, and then we're going to go downstairs for a few drinks. Uh, now, a little bit about Anne. And, uh, you know, it's all going to come. So I'm here just to give a, a brief insight. Uh, Anne, I mean, it's just, I'm looking at some notes here. Anne's a world record holder and one of Britain's leading female explorers. Along with her teammate, Caroline Hamilton, they were the first woman in history to reach not just the North, but the South Pole. What's even more remarkable is Anne had triplets, 18 month old, no outdoor experience when she first applied to go on a polar expedition. That to me is remarkable. That's just, that is what, I don't know what, and maybe it's a chance to ask Anne, what was it that day? Were the kids that much trouble that you thought, I'm out of here, you know? But it's just, it's phenomenal when you think of these things. Uh, she was also a single mother. You know, if you take that into context, these are the kind of minds that we should cherish, that we get the chance to meet, talk to, and ask questions of. Uh, Anne's just back from a recent Two Degrees North Polar exhibition that she undertook in April with her teammate eh, Bernice Nottenbaum, I hope I pronounced that right, and Martin Hartley. Working with NASA and ESA, ESA, Anne has explained it to me, I can't pronounce it, so I apologise, but Anne will explain what it is, eh, to measure ice thickness and take snow measurements while skiing from 88 degrees to 90 degrees, which apparently is 120 miles. Eh, there's not much I can say other than it's great pleasure tonight to introduce someone of Anne's calibre here to come to Napier as our third guest and to thank you guys for supporting this. It means a great deal. Prince Charles once described Anne as a wonderful example of determination and true British grit. Please welcome Anne Dyer. Hey, Anne Dyer. Thank you.
Thank you, and thank you for coming here on this uh, nice day uh, and sitting in this uh, lecture theatre. Dare to dream big. I'm a great believer in, in dreaming big, but it's no good just dreaming. You have to actually do something about it. Uh, and I recently read a book. It was called The Contiki. If you have a chance, you should read it. It's a great story of adventure. But the first words in the book really spoke to me. And it said, some, believe, some people believe in fate and some don't. Well, I can tell you, I do and I don't. Because fate brings you all here. It takes you to this university. It brings people who come to the university and brings you in contact with people. You may not have any control about that. You may, if you study here, you won't have control who your teachers were. But where fate stops and you step in is you can control what you do with fate, who you talk to, who you stay friends with for the rest of your life, who you decide in two seconds you never want to see again. And it's the same with opportunities. They come to you at all times, and sometimes you may choose to let them go. Sometimes you may not see them. Sometimes you may be afraid to follow them because you think you're not good enough. Those are the ones that I would say to you today, don't let them go. Grab them with all your hands and do everything you can to follow those opportunities because that's where you take over from fate. And don't let fear of failure stop you because if you don't try, you will never succeed. And if you don't make it, you may have had a great journey and you will certainly have learned something about yourself and something you can put into new opportunities. So how did it start for me? Yes, I did have triplets, but I am just quickly going to even go back and say I came from a working class background and I went to a normal comprehensive school. And that's where I learned to believe you can do the impossible. I wasn't that good at school, and I, it's true to say, I perhaps didn't apply myself. One of the teachers believed in me. It was a maths teacher, because I have a natural aptitude for maths. And he pulled me on one side and said, if you carry on like this, that's fine. You're going to fail everything. But you have a brain. You are so bright. If you actually work, you could achieve so much more. And I could have just carried on the way I carried on. But because he believed in me, nobody had ever believed in me before, I thought I'd have a go. And so I actually left school. Um, I wasn't going to take any exams, but I actually left school with nine GCSEs, which for me and my family were unheard of. I was the only one that ever got any. And I went on to get a job in a bank. That was going to be my great achievement in life. And again, for my family, nobody had ever worked in that kind of an industry. And I worked really hard, and, and, and that was my sense of purpose and my great achievement. But life changes. And actually, how did I go from a financial background to a polar explorer? Well, it was right. It was the birth of my triplets. I had three children. I hadn't expected to have three, and that was a, a huge challenge. And so I left the bank. I was going to go back and, and be a duty manager. Wouldn't that be great? But I left, and I didn't go back. And I started to look after them. And it's hard bringing up three children, especially with the rocky marriage. And, and, and my husband didn't, didn't really deal with that very well, and, and we ended up splitting up. Um, and I loved it the challenge of looking after these children. And I realized if I could do this, I could do anything. So I literally saw an advert in a newspaper, and it asked for ordinary women to apply to become part of the first all-female team to walk to the North Pole. Now, that's one of the opportunities that fate, I just happened to have seen it or was shown it, and I could have let it go. And there was every reason not to apply. I had never had walking boots on my feet. I'd never had any outdoor experience. I was a single mother of small children. I knew nothing about the North Pole. But I thought, well, I'll just apply and see what happens. I don't think I really thought I would get on the team, but I'll just see what it's all about. So I applied, 
I had my first big challenge when I got a kit list through because I didn't own anything on the kit list and I couldn't afford to buy anything on the kit list. Um, but where there are challenges, there are always solutions. And I lived in a military town, so I called some friends up. Within two weeks, I had everything I needed on the kit list. It was all a rather strange shade of olive green, but <laughs> it would do. Uh, and I was given instructions to arrive on Dartmoor. Uh, Dartmoor is uh, down in the southwest, and it is when the weather kicks in, it can be, for me, the most miserable place on the planet. It's got bogs, it's just full of marshes, and there are tours and hills. And when I arrived, over 250 other applicants turned up. Every one of them were outward bound instructors, mountaineers, really hardy outdoor types. They had done everything. And I literally was the only person who had done nothing. Uh, it's fair to say I completely failed. Completely. I was out of my depth. The rucksack I had on, I'd put too much in there. I was in pain after an hour. And they walked us for about nine, ten hours. After two or three hours, when it got dark and it was miserable, I was crying without letting anybody see me. And I just put one foot in front of the other, thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I here? I just want to go home. But then something happened. Is they didn't choose the team that weekend. I most certainly would not have got on the team. What they did is they called everybody together and said, OK, you know what we're going to do. You've got nine months. And you can give it up if you want to give it up. And don't come back. But if you come back in nine months, we're going to have four days of this. And then we're going to pick the team. And at first, I thought, oh, well, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming back. <laughs> I'm going home. That's it. And then I began to think, well, I've got nine months, actually. And what I had done is I put one foot in front of the other when everything was painful. I'd been tested mentally. The other girls found it really easy. So I figured that if I gave everything, everything, then I would know at the end of nine months if I was good enough. Or I could give up. I chose not to give up. So the next nine months, I was on my own with three 18-month-old children, were spent. I asked the local gym to sponsor me, and I would put them in the crash where I worked out upstairs. Uh, and then in an afternoon when they slept, there was no coffee and friends around for me. I was doing military style circuits in my back garden, which wasn't very big and, and running around. The neighbors thought I'd gone absolutely mad. But bit by bit, I got stronger. Friends taught me how to read a map. I couldn't even read a map. And in nine months time, I went back down to Dartmoor. And as I walked through, the selectors recognized me for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> oh my God, what's she doing here? And I kept in touch. They were absolutely amazed that I'd bothered to turn up. But there was a difference. This time, I knew what to do, and I was strong enough. I could be part of the team. I could read a map, and I could perform. And instead of being in absolute pain and horror, I loved this Dartmoor that I thought was hell on earth and really enjoyed the outside. I'd found something I, I'd never knew, and, and I found a little bit of me. It made me feel alive. Uh, and so at the end of that selection period, I certainly wasn't the best there. When they called the names out for the team, because I changed so much and put so much into it, I couldn't believe it when they called my name out. I'd got on the team. I was going to the Arctic. This is my introduction to the polar world. And it was a relay. I was really fortunate I was on the first leg of the journey. So there were five teams of four women with two guides, because obviously we had not the skills to travel on the Arctic Ocean. And I was in Team Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and finally Team Echo was the last team. But when they put me on the Arctic Ocean, and I learned how to ski, I'd never skied, of course, I loved it. 
This was nature at its best. I and mean, we couldn't hide out there. It didn't matter if we were rich, we were poor, or what background it came from. When you're living on the edge of existence, it's who you are inside that matters. How you react with people, how you conduct yourself, and, and your honesty and your integrity, and your willingness to work for the team. And the team were great. And I found at the age of 30, with three children, what I was meant to do for the next step of my life. Uh, like I said, we were on the first team. Uh, we only covered, we'll say only, we covered 37 miles, which was, which was a lot for the first team. Then Bravo came in, Charlie Delta. And finally, on the 27th of May, 1997, Team Echo stood on the pole. We'd done it our own way, it was a relay, and when they stood on the pole, I was back home, but it felt as much an achievement as us who had gone home than, than the girls that stepped on the pole, because we'd worked together. But that expedition lit a fire in me, and dreaming big is not just one thing. You have to improve and, and look. So five of us got together. We made a plan where all best plans are made in the pub. <sighs> we want to do something else, but we want an expedition that's ours and, and that we put together, we plan, we train for, we execute. And so uh, no British women's team had skied across Antarctica from the ocean to the South Pole, and that seemed to us to be a big challenge for ourselves. So the team of five were Zoe Hudson, Paul Oliver, Caroline Hamilton, myself, and Rosie Stancer. And this time we learned everything, and we really worked hard. We had to learn how to navigate by the sun, because out there, so close to, to the magnetic pole, we were walking to the true pole, but compasses don't work very well. You can't use a GPS because the batteries don't work. We travelled in single file. Antarctica is the windiest continent on Earth. It's the highest continent. It's the coldest continent. It actually holds over 70% of the world's fresh water in its ice cap, but it's technically a desert. There are no rainfall. There is no rainfall. There are no pools of water. So all our water was uh, the snow around us that we melted and made drinks. And we travelled, one behind the other. We came across one large crevasse and some small ones for 700 miles. But the thing about Antarctica is if you keep going, and it is a battle of the mind because you are walking, it took us 61 days, and you are walking, pulling a heavy sledge across rough ice and snow in terrible temperatures, for 61 days, and you don't see anything else. The sledge is heavy, and so you just keep going. When I say you don't see anything else, you see an occasional mountain, and the Thiel Mountains halfway. Otherwise, it is just mile upon mile upon mile of ice and snow. Uh, we each respected each other. We had um, our jobs. Myself and Caroline were the navigators. Pom um, learned all about food, and she put all our food um, and cooking. Rosie did all our uh, scientific work. It was an expedition with a little bit of science added on. We felt while we're there, we took weather data for Exeter University, and Zoe was our doctor. And by working together, <laughs> eventually, after 61 days, we saw the South Pole, and we skied on in, and we put our flag up the way all Brits do. <laughs> but us, these are great stars and stripes because at the South Pole is the Amundsen Scott Polar Research Base. So it's full of scientists. And they all came out of the base. They were just fantastic to greet us and took photographs. Uh, and I remember clearly the commander from the base stepped forward and said, um, I understand you know, you're at one with nature. If you want to put your tent out here and stay out here, we'll, we'll respect your wishes. <laughs> However, if you'd like to come inside, we have food and we have champagne. <laughs> I ate 18 sausages. <laughs> so we'd gone to the, the South Pole, um, but no women's team had gone 
the whole way to the North Pole. I began to do a small bit of guiding, and that's where my dream really was, to go the whole way to the North Pole in a women's team. We'd done it in real, and it had never been achieved. And to think about how difficult it is, in 1909, Peary first claimed to get to the pole. When I put the team together to go to the North Pole, in 2002, only 68 expeditions had ever made it, including with dogs, skidoos, or, or any other way across the surface. When you think of the thousands that have climbed Everest, and many who go to the South Pole, it was a huge undertaking. It took me a very long time to persuade Pom and Caroline to join me. They'd already been on the relay and had some concept. But eventually, uh, they came on board. Because if you don't believe what you want to do and you don't believe in yourself and you don't believe you can do it, you are never going to persuade someone else. So dare to dream big, but believe. Believe in your mission and your goal. And eventually, uh, they came with me. M&G were our sponsors. Uh, the North Geographic Pole is, uh, you can see it there, it's in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. The Magnetic Pole, which is not to be confused with the Geographic Pole, moves around, and that's the end of the bar magnet that the compass points to. The Geographic Pole is the very centre. So if you think about it, once you're on the Arctic Ocean, what North, which is going to sound very confusing, but really sorry, is pointing, if you get your compass out, North is southwest of you because the magnetic pole was southwest of us. So that was always a strange concept that we're going true north, not magnetic north. We chose, there are two places to actually make a record, you have to live from land. You may often hear about the youngest, oldest, biggest, but a lot of people generally do what they call a last degree. It's a last degree of latitude, which is 60 miles. But a true record is land. There are two main places to launch from Russia or Canada, um, if you go from Greenland, the current runs so fast, the ice takes you out and you can't physically get there, similar with around Norway. So, again, we went back to the pub <laughs> to discuss, do we go from Russia, do we go from Canada? And in the end, it came down to simply, there are less polar bears in Canada, let's go from there. To leave from Canada, Ellesmere Island, you can just see it, hopefully there, you may not, it's quite a distance. Uh, it's a shorter distance as the crow flies to the North Pole than Russia, but because of the way the currents, the ice is always going to land, so you actually have a farther distance. If you leave from Russia, the, I the ice, because of the currents, goes towards the pole. So it looks shorter, but physically, it's longer. It looks simple there, just a little dot that we're going to go to. But actually, nothing is simple. It's not like Antarctica where you walk one mile and you're gone one mile. The North Pole moves constantly. The ice splits. It rises up in pressure ridges. It is horrific. The temperatures in a marine environment are much worse than the dry environment of Antarctica. I thought I knew what to expect. I'd been on the first leg of the journey in 1997. In 2002, when we went, temperatures were so cold. I have never experienced cold like it since or before. It was a really cold year. And temperatures for the first 27 days were between minus 48 and minus 56 on the thermometer Celsius. To put that in some context, your freezers are around minus 18. So think about what it's doing to all those sausages or all Scotland salmon that it's doing in there. It was trying to do that constantly to our fingers, our toes, anything that wasn't moving was in absolute danger of freezing. And I sort of expected that, that it would be cold, not that cold. But what really shocked me and what we hadn't expected was our brains slowed down. We were in a mild state of hypothermia for the first 27 days. So we would pick a bag up and stagger to the sledge. And, and I remember I, I led from the front in the first three days because I, I had guiding experience. And I remember in the third day, 
about a third of the way through, just stopping and thinking, I can't see. I've gone blind. I don't understand it. I've never heard of extreme cold making you blind. And then I realized that what had happened is the eyes had built up so much on my eyelashes, I was literally stood there with my eyes closed. <laughs> So who needs eyelashes out there? <laughs> Off they went. During the early days, we constantly had to look at each other. We couldn't wear goggles as we did in, South, in the South Pole because as we breathed in the damp air, they just constantly fogged up. And the ice moves towards the land in Canada, so we were going over huge ridges and we had to see. So we constantly checked each other's faces we got frostbite and, and would warm each other up. If it was bad outside, when we got in the tent, because of weight, we didn't have a tent floor, we couldn't carry enough fuel to heat the tent, so it was the same temperatures in the tent, but we weren't moving, it was freezing. And you have to think about, what are you going to give up to follow your dreams? Well, we, in Resolute Bay, where we were doing our preparations, at first we couldn't pull our sledges, so we got rid of everything that we didn't need. Wrappers, half a toothbrush, a couple of cameras. We just took one small camera that took video and, and cameras. Uh, even our toilet paper went. You know you're dedicated when you're prepared to wipe your bottom with ice wedges at minus 58. <laughs> But you have to give things up. And you have to put yourself out there. Nothing worthwhile is, is going to be achieved without some sacrifice. So all we had was two small cookers, a mug, a spoon, a diary, and a pencil. If we couldn't eat it, couldn't get us to the pole, it didn't come. We went 80 days without washing or changing our clothes. We had carbon monoxide poisoning on day six. The vents in the, the tent had frozen up, and actually this is a clear picture, but when we lit the cookers, the steam in so cold filled the tent, and we hadn't seen the vents had frozen. And I looked at Pom at the end of cooking one day, and she literally collapsed in front of me. We dragged her out, and, and for an hour, she didn't know her own name, didn't know her brother's name. We had to bring her around and, and then put her in bed, and, and we watched her constantly throughout the night. Will she survive? I thought the expedition had done then. And she was OK, and I spoke to her the next morning and said, do you want to give up? Do you want to stop now? Because as much as I believed, it's not for me to drag somebody along if they think they're going to die. And Pom is extremely brave and said, no, I, I want to keep going. I want to keep going. So that day we kept going. And, and what we did then is we cut a hole in the roof of the tent and we always cooked with the doors open, which meant it was really cold. But it, we weren't afraid anymore from carbon monoxide poisoning. Within six days, because of the steam and the cold, our, our sleeping bags were so frozen, we had to break into them and climb into them through the ice and lie there. We thought things couldn't get worse. And then <laughs> things can always get worse. We put our tent up and the ground that we put it on was flat. And about 4 a.m. it sheared. This is the picture of the ice. And that, when it sheared up, next to our tent. The noise and the shaking of the ice was horrific. We all got out of our sleeping bags and all around it, the ice began to crack. If we went in, we would die. So we did have um, preparations. We thought about everything. We planned everything. What if, if the ice starts to break up? And we each had our roles to play. And we played them. Mine was in, in the tent and I could feel the tent juddering and the ice cracking, and I just threw everything out, couldn't see anything. Pom grabbed everything and threw it in the sledges, and Caroline's job was simply to watch for the last second when we had to get out. And the trust I had to put in here when I could feel the ice was, was huge, but we did, because you have to trust your teammates, you have to trust each other. And eventually we, we got out, and I also believe you just celebrate whenever you can. So we stopped, 
we celebrated with the only thing we had, which was a couple of pieces of chocolate. I ate 25 kilograms of chocolate on that expedition and still lost two stone in weight. <laughs> And then as we stood there, Paul uh, looked at me and went, I'm slightly freaked, the wind's changed. And I said, well, I'm slightly freaked as well. You know, we just nearly died again. Um, and she said, no, no, the wind's changed. Um, so I said, well, let's put the tent up, let's have some breakfast and just see what's going to happen with the weather. Within 10 minutes, the wind had picked up to such an extent we knew that we wouldn't get the tent up properly. So we went into our other emergency, uh, pom-pom routines. Why I always had to pom, I have no idea. But if you take the tent out of the bag when it's windy and the wind catches it and it goes, you're going to die. It takes two days for the plane in good weather to get to you from where they are. It's not one of those areas where you can just call emergency rescue and an hour later they're there. So you have to be able to look after yourself. You can't build a snow hole on the Arctic Ocean. You'll drop in. So we clipped it to Pom, and the wind was so ferocious, it picked up Pom the tent and her heavy sledge and slammed her against the bridge and damaged her shoulder. So we knew we wouldn't get the tent up. We uh, put it on the ground. We put the sledges around it, and we crawled under the tent material and we lay there for three days while the wind battered us. All we had was a few bits of chocolate and nuts and some water, and we just couldn't do anything. And in times like that, when you can't change, we couldn't change the wind, we couldn't change the fact we couldn't get out of our tent, all you can change is, is you and how you deal with it. And so I won't say we stayed positive, <laughs> But we didn't freak, and we lay there next to each other. We couldn't speak because of the wind, even though we were next to each other. And time kind of stood still, and all bad things do come to an end. So after three days, the, the sun came out, the wind stopped. That was our, our covering. So what do you do? It's, you're so far behind schedule, you're not going to make it. It is the best travelling day of the expedition. Well, we just took the day off. <laughs> we put the tent up and we talked, and we talked about what we wanted to do. And did we want to keep going was the first. And quite surprisingly, we all did. We'd been through so much. We didn't mind now if we didn't get to the pole, and that's the honest truth. It was no longer about we're going to make it because we really thought this is impossible, but we don't want to give in. And the moment we give in, we have failed. So we're just going to do every day. And we looked to the future and went ahead positively. And we're going to have a great journey and do the best we can do today. Well, not that day, because we had a day off. <laughs> but the next day. And so we left the tent the next day, a little bit battered, a little bit scared, but positive. But as we skied forward, we realized we'd all got frostbite whilst we were under the tent. Uh, Caroline's fingers were frostbitten. That's when they're better. They were bulging and blistered. And so she couldn't get them out in the tent or, or obviously outside at the time. She had to keep them with three layers of gloves and keep them warm at all time with any chance of recovery. But she couldn't do anything for herself. So I would cook and give her her food and she'd sort of eat it with a spoon. In the morning, we dressed her... She couldn't even go to the toilet on her own. The mother of three children, Caroline and I, are very close still. But she didn't think, what can't I do? Because that's, that's easy, isn't it? Well, you know, when things are difficult, you can, you can go inside yourself. But she thought, what can I do? And what she could do is she could pull a sledge. So that's what she did. We were actually three to a sledge in the early days because of the heaviness and going over the ridges. So she pulled it from the front and Pom and I would, would push behind and then we'd go back and, and get the next one. The terrain to the North Pole, I was asked earlier which is easier, south or north. The North Pole terrain is horrific. It's brutal. It's mashed up ice that moves and always against you. 
On day 37, we'd got a window of opportunity. We actually managed to squeeze 80 days, but it was between 75 and 80 days. We knew before the ice would melt and we'd need to get out. On day 37, we had gone just 69 of the 500 miles. We've got frostbite. It was an impossible journey. The, wane was, the terrain was against us, and I can remember skiing and, and with the frostbite, and I could feel the damage. And as I'm skiing, I could feel it happening, and there's nothing I could do to warm my feet up except stop the expedition and put the tent up. And I thought, well, I'm not going to do that because if we do that when we have failed. And I can remember thinking, OK, I can feel my middle toe. Wow. I can live without a middle toe. Who needs a middle toe anyway? And my little toe. I didn't feel that going at the time. Yeah, 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 I don't mind a little toe. Oh, I got a big toe. That's when I'm, I've done it. That's, I'm not having that. And it seems mad, but at the time, that's how I felt. Uh, Caroline, uh, Caroline's fingers were bad, Pom's toes were really bad, and we had a lot of conversations because she really couldn't ski fast and the, she got wet gangrene. So each night we would care for her because there was no blame in the team. We all had difficulties, and when anybody had difficulties, we cared and we looked at how we could help each other. And we put dressings on a night. Pom skied for 47 days on those feet. 47 days. We had a resupply on day 47, and we knew long before that Pom would have to get on that plane or she'd lose her feet, and, and that would be the end of it anyway. But for me, who'd put the expedition and was leading it, it was important she made the decision, not was pushed out. And uh, when the plane came, there was a medic on board, she uh, exited the expedition, which was a brave, brave decision. I never considered, strangely, getting on the resupply plane. Um, I did think we're not going to make it. And my motivation wasn't good enough at the time. And we missed POM. And then, Caroline and I, something kind of magical we happened. We had th over 300 miles and less than 30 days. POM became our driving force because she had sacrificed her dream. Also, when she left, the weather changed. It got significantly warmer. And as you go towards the North Pole, the ice is less. So it's thicker near the coast where it's all been pushed. So you get more areas of open water, more areas of thin ice. So you're constantly going around things. But where there are problems, there are always opportunities. Sometimes the split would be like a river and you could see the other side and we'd find an island and, and get away. It was always about how do we get over this? How do we get around it? How do we just keep going? Where you get open water, you do get bears. Uh, not on this expedition, uh, but I was stalked on a solo expedition when I was on my own for three days by that bear. It was the most terrifying experience of my life, without a doubt. But when I came out of it, we both survived uninjured. Equally, it's the most unique and wonderful experience of my life. So I carry him around to remind me to be brave in, in situations and, and that sometimes the things that we fear become the things that are most precious to us. We did new things on this expedition. A guy called Boyle Grassland had designed this suit, but teams didn't swim out in the Arctic Ocean. But the ice is getting thinner. Uh, and so we had Mr Orange, which is basically just a plastic bag you put over um, your, your clothing. And at first we were very afraid. Nobody wants to go in the dark, deep Arctic Ocean. I've seen those films where giant octopuses come and get you. <laughs> I know what happens. So first we used it to go across thin ice because we had to go across some of the ice. And we couldn't go across without it because if we went in and we were wet, we would certainly die. But if we stayed dry, then we could survive. Thankfully for me, that is a picture of Caroline. I'd gone across and I'm a little bit lighter than Caroline. <laughs> And she didn't quite make it. Uh, but she tested it, and it worked. And she stayed dry, and she broke the ice all the way to me and got out the other side. So the thing that we were afraid of suddenly became the thing that helped us. And we began to use it in earnest. And at first, we were a bit clumsy, and we'd pull the sledge behind. But we got better at it and better at it. But just because something's working 
doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. So I would always challenge you to look at new ways. And we began to think, why are we getting in? We've eaten most of our sledge. We've burnt most of the fuel, not sledge, the food, obviously. Burnt the fuel. So we began to use the sledges as surfboards. So we didn't get in the water. We used the sledges as bridges, anything. As soon as we came to an obstacle, we stopped thinking, oh, gosh, not another obstacle. It was just, right, how do we get around this? It always became about how can we keep going? We added hours to our days. We would ski extra hour just each day. Sleep became less. When we took a break, if there was a ridge, we always went over it before we took the break, if it was our break time. If there was an open water, we always went over the open water. And by doing that, suddenly we began, we became a force. We began to realize that this impossible thing may just be possible. But I don't think it was until two days before that we began to talk about the pole. It was never mentioned until two days before. We knew we had two days because the plane was on its way. It takes two days to get to us. We knew that, and they'd set off. They were coming. The ice was melting. The, uh, the logistics had taken it. This is your exit. We still had 60 miles to go, so we weren't there by any means. And that day, we went mostly east. We couldn't get over. This body of water was over a kilometre, which we couldn't swim in. It was too dangerous. And I really thought at the very end, oh, we're so close, and, and we've only gone east. And we both sort of cried a little bit. We didn't tell each other. And we figured, well... We're not going to sleep because we have to give everything in this last two days. But we checked our GPS at the end of what would have been the first days, 24-hour darkness, so we didn't have to sleep. And even though we hadn't skied north, the ice had now started to move north. So we'd started to move further and further north, and it speeded up. And we just kept, as we were walking, it was going faster and faster. But I don't think... It was until we got to the last ridge, we got the uh, flag out. So to find the North Pole, we navigated with our sun, with the sun and our watches. But to find the actual North Pole is where we got the GPS out. Because the North Pole is a fixed place and you're on a moving crust of ice, as you're actually coming up to it, you're, uh, the ice that we were on was moving over here. So suddenly it's behind us. How does that happen? And then the ice might move over here, and then it might move here. So it looks as if the pole is running away from you. So you literally get the GPS out and count down the coordinates. The North Pole is, is 90 degrees north. We went over the last ridge, and this body of water was in front of us. We thought, we can't, we can't swim around with the GPS. We worked our way onto that little island in that, by the crack. We stood there looking at each other, and, and the North Pole was out in the water. The plane was literally hours, two hours. What are we going to do? We can't be 30 metres from the pole. <laughs> and then as we stood there, we battled every day. But at the very end, those last two days, as we stood there, tears in our eyes, panicking, the actual ice island itself just took itself over the North Pole. Bang, we got it. So... We did put the uh, flag in. We did sing the national anthem. That is the picture at the top of the world. We didn't have time to put the tent up, so I put my best dress on. We celebrated with a small tot of whiskey, uh, had some beef stew, and we hit every national newspaper. And it always said, Anne Daniels and Caroline Hamilton, the first women to walk to both poles. And it always made me a little bit sad because, yes, we were... But actually, if it hadn't have been for Paul Oliver's sacrifice, we would never have got there. So she was certainly there in spirit. And I would like to say that it was actually not just Anne Daniels and Caroline Hamilton. It was Paul Oliver, Anne Daniels and Caroline Hamilton. And so I'm just going to... That, that, it was just the most amazing feeling... And then what do you do? Don't worry, I'm not going to go through a lot more uh, expeditions. But I just want to sort of, for the last sort of five minutes, take you through where I moved from there and evolved. Because that was, we were the first women's team to do both poles for the whole way. But for me, the records just weren't enough. I wanted something else. I loved this place. Uh, and I wanted to do something different. So thankfully, 
In 2009, Penn Haddo came to me and he had put, we talked about this a lot, he was the guy that did the original selection and we'd become really good friends and we both talked about the passion and he had put together an expedition. Now this guy is one of the toughest men I know. He was the first man to go unsupported from Canada to the North Pole. So a huge expeditioner in his own right. And he had put this expedition together um, with a lot of scientists around the world to measure the thickness of the North Pole ice cap so that they could understand when it might disappear and what's happening up there. Martin Hartley, who's also in the picture, was his photographer. Because whilst we were working with scientists to try and give them data, there's no point in actually finding out if nobody cares. And the only way to get people to care, the real people, is through film and photographs. So his job was to photograph. And Penn, which I thought was a pretty brave stroke for a guy who's a great expeditioner, said, Anne, I want you to lead my team and me on the ice from the front. But that was a bit me and he said yeah not because you're a woman or it's good for PR because I think you're the best <laughs> which was marvelous for somebody like him to say that and he couldn't do it because he was taking the science so uh, Prince Charles was our patron and we hit the Arctic Ocean my job was to go to the front and lead the team the whole physically the whole way find a route and make sure we had enough space for everything Martin's was to take photograph and video, and Penn's was to do the science. And what I'll say about this, what I wanted to show you this, was that team had three goals. It was to go as far as possible, to take photographs and do the science. And we're all expeditionists, so we all feel passionate about going as far as we can. And so that's what we did for the first day and the second day. And then realised, oh my gosh, we're not doing the science. So then we'd spend two days doing the science. Oh gosh, we're not doing the photographs. And then we'd spend two days doing the photographs. And at first, it was a bunch of bananas. We're running around, not really achieving anything. And then we sat down and said, no, this is hopeless. What, what are we doing wrong? And we said, right, OK, let's go to what do we want to achieve? Who are we? We're a scientific expedition. That's what we are. We're not going to the pole to be the first, the best, the longest, the quickest. We're a scientific expedition. What's the next important thing? To take photographs, to share it with the world. And actually, the least important thing, which was unfortunately my job, was to go as far as possible. So by looking at what we really wanted to achieve and working together, we became one of the most successful expeditions of the time David Shookman came in and we did a fantastic expedition. The year after, we had different... Uh, Penn moved out and said, this is your team, and now, who do you want to bring in? Because it got so big, he was working with so many institutions, he didn't want to spend the time on the ice. So I asked Charlie to join me. And again, I had fear. Charlie's a big Royal Marine who's done a big expedition. Martin's huge. And as a woman, I... At first, I was frightened, am I good enough, big enough, strong enough with these guys? And I realised that I couldn't pull the same weight as them. I couldn't. We all trained hard. So I had to find out who I was and value what I brought to the team. And it was no good me fighting, I want to pull as much as you, because that would have slowed the whole team down. So I think you have to find your own value. What do you bring to a team and, and be true to who you are? And what I brought to the team is I was good at navigating, I did all the swimming and the things that I could do, and the guys did what they did best. And by each of us doing the best that we can, again, we were a great expedition. We uh, collected um, more data, we drilled the eyes, but this time it was ocean acidification because the chemistry of our oceans is changing. So we collected water, on the whole transit and, and took it back. And again, we worked with scientists around the world. And then finally, um, we actually took a scientist and a filmmaker the year afterwards with uh, Tyler Fish. And uh, he led it with me. Uh, so I had two novices. And each night, Adrian, again, would look at the ocean chemistry and the uh, temperature of the water. Uh, I drilled on that. Uh, I loved that. I loved drilling um, because he obviously had too much to do. And Phil uh, took uh, a camera that was to be made into a documentary, 
with all his stuff. And I'm just going to play a little clip of um, some of the footage that he took. In March 2011, four of the world's toughest explorers were dropped into the frozen Arctic Ocean. Their mission? To measure the thickness of sea ice in the most extreme conditions on the planet. Minus 20 at the moment, it's nothing. This is great. Braving temperatures of minus 75 degrees, they forced their way through Arctic storms towards the North Pole to collect data that will provide the blueprint for our future. It's melting from below as well as above. Their bodies under constant attack. My eyelids are beginning to freeze up. Their habitat the most hostile of all. And our cameras alongside them every step of the way. It's closing in on us. That's how it goes. It's like some sort of roulette game. In six remarkable weeks, these hardened experts were at the mercy of the brutal Arctic weather. This is just ridiculous. Putting their lives on the line. We misjudged the length of rope. Are the sharks in the Arctic Ocean? Exactly. Pretty sure. Great whites, right? Sacrificing their safety in the name of science. This epic journey took them into the heart of the North Pole. We are still in the middle of nowhere. Yep. And where are we going? Closer to somewhere. Cut from the toughest cloth and spurred on by the thrill of risking it all, they are the mavericks of elite exploration. And I can't leave you without just finishing my last expedition. I have done others, but I've just got back from uh, Denise Noten Boom and the last one. And this was 120 miles. And uh, again, I was employed for my skills as, as leader. But to talk a little bit about just dreaming big and, and going for things and seeing opportunities. Uh, we were working with NASA um, and the European Space Agency, which was ESA, and we were measuring the thickness of the ice. And NASA were literally flying over us, and they were using their radar to measure the ice, and we were helping calibrate their radars, because we had a ruler. And at first, we were thinking about how they could absolutely be sure they were on top of us with their flights. And we talked about bin bags and said, oh, you know, we're a, a climate change expedition. How, you know, how can you see us? And I was having dinner two days before we due to leave with the head of NASA. And he said, oh, the best thing, of course, is a, is a radar. And I said, well, is that absolutely impossible? And he went, yeah, we've only got two days, and I don't have any. And I went, OK, and he sat there. That could be the end. And he was eating. He went, but I know somebody who had a project, and they've got them, and they're in deepest America. And he went, but we've got 48 hours. And I looked at him, and I went, well, you are the head of NASA. And he went, I am. He went, I'm going to try. He went, I'm going to try. So he got, he said, I'm sorry, I have to be rude. He got on his phone at dinner at that time. So within 48 hours, he had got permission from the guys whose project it was in America that he could take out their radars to use on his project. He had got somebody in deepest America to get them out of storage because what had happened, the project had had to stop. The guy had, unfortunately, whose project it was, died. Got them out of storage. He got them to be delivered and authorised to a pilot in America that handed them to another pilot in a major city in America, who then took them to Norway and handed to another commercial pilot, who then flew them to Svalbard, where we were. Then it was agreed, then they were commissioned, and then they were set up. And then he said, we got it within 48 hours. And then he went, how are you going to get it on the ice? I went, well, not officially, because we're now taking, can you imagine, an American signaling beacon on a Russian military aircraft. <laughs> so somehow I'm going to have to get this under my coat and in my sledge. Uh, uh, and we did. Just as we were about to go, they check all your sledges. So it had all been checked. It had gone off to cargo. But because it is, it's the Russians. I thought, Victor, I've got to put this coat in my sledge. Is that OK? And he went, yeah, and of course, the radar went in. <laughs> so we got it there. There it was. 48 hours from a chance opportunity, a chance, let's just have a go. And what that meant was that NASA... Oh, Yay! Oh, my God. Here they come. Think my crop. Jesus. There they are. I'm going to try and find them.
nearly forgot to stop it. You do not want to know what came out of my mouth then. <laughs> Uh, and that was this North Pole. Every North Pole is different. It's always a different piece of ice. And that's sort of where I want to finish. But I want to come back to the dare to dream big. Don't just dare it. Do something about it. Let fate bring you opportunities, but then you grab them. Just do something. Nothing worthwhile is achieved without some sacrifice. And if you don't have a go... You will never make it. So do something, anything, but believe in yourself. And thank you. But it's not here at Edinburgh Napier, and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everybody here. And I say that was truly, truly inspirational, inspirational lecture. I also would say, from a personal point of view, I'm never going to complain about the weather in Edinburgh again. <laughs> um, but I'm delighted that Anne has actually uh, agreed to spend uh, a few minutes before we head down for, for drinks to pick up her uh, and answer any questions we may have sort of immediately um, on, on, the, on the lecture you just heard. Um, so if you, we have a couple of microphones that we can take around, around the, the audience. So if you'd like to put your hand up if you have any questions, we've, we've got time for four or five questions now. Um, can't quite see with the... Uh, yeah. qu question over here then, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. That was uh, really uh, quite awe-inspiring actually. Um, I just wondered, you were talking about fate, how that had, um, you know, fate uh, came your way when you saw that, that newspaper advert and that kind of changed your life, really. Do you think if you hadn't seen that advert, the, the qualities that you've since shown would have come out in banking or whatever else it was that, that you might have ended up doing? Yes, I do. I, I genuinely do. I think that, as I said, I learnt it at, at school for the first time. Um, and... It had already come out with the children. When I kind of glibly say, oh, I could, if I had three children, I could do anything. When I had the three babies, uh, I remember a nurse coming to me in hospital and saying, and, and I think it was a good thing, it wasn't a bad thing. She said, Anne, you're not going to cope with these three children on your own. People don't cope with one child. And so what I want to do is say, you don't have big expectations of yourself. I want to give you my personal number and contact. And you must ask for help. And you mustn't be afraid. And you mustn't think you're a failure. Because three babies are a lot. And I, I had the children by IVF. So they, all children are dear to everybody. And I said, thank you. But I will cope, and not only will I cope, I'll enjoy it, because I've waited six years for these children. Six years, and I don't want to be snowed under and to have a miserable time. And so I just thought of ways. I fed all three of them at the same time, and I would rotate them. <laughs> and one would have a bottle on every third feed, and I would go out. And if you ask me, now I look back, I think, God, it was horrific. <laughs> but at the time, I had no concept. And I was going out for a walk with them, and... And, and, and they slept, like I said, whilst I was, they were 18 months, but for the first 18 months, small children are full time. And I loved it. And I was, oh, it's fine, it's great. I was on an absolute high from just adrenaline the whole time. And I did cope with it, and I loved it. And I think those are the skills that I took into the polar world that I can do it, I will do it, or I'll do the best I can do. And a lot of people also say to me things like, I was the only person on any of the expeditions. Polar exploration tends to be for the elite and people who have been brought up to believe they can do it, private schools, etc. I was, I'm possibly even now one of the very few people I know who come from, uh, if you will, a, a, a tough background. Um, I was born in, 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 in a city, Bradford, on one of the estates. So actually, for me, I had the perfect background. I knew how to be tough and how to keep going and how to deal with things that weren't perhaps all that great. So now I do think that what, even if I hadn't seen that advert, something else would have happened. I wouldn't have gone back to the bank. I might have started my own business. I may have done something else. But after the children, I was starting to think bigger. And they were a great 
it's a, it's a great dichotomy, I guess, because I left them to do this, but they, I needed to show them how to live, and, and I also needed to earn money because I was on my own. I didn't have any money to support them, and there was so much that I had to do to bring these children up properly and to the best of my ability. So something, I'd have had to have done something, something else. Thank you. Any, any, any other questions? Another so question up there. Back. Firstly, I just wanted to say thank you very much. That was absolutely inspirational and real testament to what you can do with determination and focus and, and, and positivity. It was more a kind of slightly geeky technical question. You mentioned that you navigate by the sun a lot. In somewhere like the North Pole, where the terrain's constantly moving, and I'd imagine quite a significant amount of the time, visibility is absolutely zero. How exactly does that work? Is there times where you just kind of have to go, well, we're just going to have to guess and wing it today and hopefully <laughs> we can find something tomorrow? Sort of yes and no. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm navigating by the sun in my watch, but there are... Uh, and I work out exactly where it is from the line of longitude because that's the time zone. So you, I work it out, um, and I, every time we cross a time zone, a line of longitude, east or west, I have to either add or take on. So when the sun is up, that's very easy. Uh, and you can just do that. And you're never moving that fast swinging during the day. And, and it's only four minutes per line of longitude, so it, it's pretty much... And because you're always going round things, it's never going to be absolutely. So you're going north. But when the sun isn't there, that's when, obviously, it becomes really difficult. We could lose the sun for three days. So every night before I went to bed on a sunny day, I would mark where north was. And then in the morning, and we did have the compass, it didn't work. In the morning, I would get up, and if there wasn't a sun, I would know where north was. I used to do a big arrow on the snow and I, every night. And then you, you kind of almost used the force, and it was where the wind was coming, because the wind didn't swap about that much, and you could kind of tell when it did, where the wind was going, where it was going across your skis, what angle it was going. I had um, one of my daughter's ribbons. I, I always have it on my ski pole, so what angle that was also blown. The, the sastrugi as well, you could see they tended to go a certain direction for the prevalent wind, which changed as we got closer. So it was a little bit finger in the wind and a little bit of you know, proper looking um, and using the nature around you. And the compass did work if you really concentrated and took a long time. So if I got completely lost, I would then stop, maybe get the GPS out for a little while, warm the batteries up or the compass and get back on course and then you'd have to again use nature. So it was just a... And it was amazing. When you're out there and you have no TV and, and no distractions, you really become one with nature. And sometimes it was just a little bit of instinct. We were always on point because we used to check each night what position we were with GPS, warm the batteries on the cooker and check where we were. Because like you say, we were drifting. We could be anywhere. We had to always know. Eat. And then in the morning, we'd check again. And one night... We had, that day we'd done, it was further on, we'd done about eight miles during the day. And when we slept, we'd gone back nine miles. Nine miles. That was, <laughs> that was a day. But yeah, so uh, quite a good question. Thank you. Did we have another question up back here? Okay, wait, this, side, this side first, then we'll come to the other question. Thank yes. you. Thank you. I applaud your achievements. Very well, good. I'm here. Sorry, we're over. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's coming out here. We all applaud your achievements. I'm curious, how do you manage to persuade your range of sponsors to take part in each of these expeditions? That's a very good question. Um, the South Pole, so the relay was quite a big thing, and it was covered by all the, the selection was covered by newspaper, media, and TV. So that sponsorship wasn't too bad, and there was a lot of people with contacts on that expedition. But when we put the South Pole together, we were a bunch of women who'd not really done anything. <laughs> you know, we'd done the relay, but with guys we weren't known, and that was really difficult. I think I wrote 2,000 letters and got nothing. What was quite humbling is occasionally you'd get... I remember this letter from a girl, so I am going to come back to it, but I will have to say this. And it was from a lady who said, I've, I've heard about you and it was adverts in newspaper and all sorts. I don't have much money. I'm really sorry, really sorry. 
you don't know me from Eve. I'm really sorry, all I can afford to give you is £50. I just was touched by somebody who could give me some money, and that was it, millions of pounds to me. But So we weren't getting sponsorship, and we were running around, and we'd got papers, newspapers on board, uh, and it wasn't until four weeks before we were due to go, we still didn't have sponsors, when M&G, we had a meeting with them, and they just said, yep, we'll give you the whole lot, we're believing you, we're looking for something new to hang on to. And they gave us the whole sponsorship, everything. So it was letter after letter after letter um, of rejection, and then luck would have it, we got M&G. But they got so much coverage, they valued it, they had a tracking company, they got up to £4 million worth of equivalent advertising spend, tracked, for a relatively small input. So when um, I was put in the North Pole, I went back to M&G and they just went, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and then it has, Then when you're a little bit more known and you've got track record, it's not easy because you're asking for hundreds of thousands of pounds. I mean, Penn, that was in the millions for the um, Catlin. Um, and so it's a big amount of money, but it's certainly easier nowadays than ever it was. In fact, I've even turned down a sponsorship because uh, I didn't want to carry that company's um, banner, if you will, to the pole. But just got to keep going. And I think we did have another another question over this side. Hi. <laughs> Hello. That's a great story. Um, Thank you. You were talking about like you're a sing you were a single mum at three yes. when you decided like the opportunity came up. What inspiration have you given your children? Because you've sacrificed a lot to be away from them. And there's a lot of single people, like single mums out there or single dads, that want to have their own goals but don't maybe have the same strength to then sacrifice the time with their children to do the same. So have your children understood that and they did. It's all in the marketing, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, to be fair, I mean, I've been doing it 20 years. The first expedition when I left them, they were too small to understand. They were three. I, I got selection at 18 months, and they were three when I left in 97. And it was a relay. So I was actually only gone for uh, four weeks. Just a lot. But because they were three, my mother and father moved into my house lock, stock and barrel. So to the children, it was very much a, oh, granny and granddad are coming to stay for a month. Um, and, and I was allowed, um, they were really good and allowing me to call home on the, um, not on the first one, um, but I could call from Canada before we left. We were running on the ice 17 days. And every time I called them, it was, oh, you know, I'm having a great time. And their little squeaky voices, uh, they had no concept. And then that actually, whilst the expedition didn't pay, because I got work speaking, it meant that I could be at home as a full-time mum <coughs> for the three years, and, and I left in 2000 to the South Pole. So for three years, I got to be a full-time mum, just doing the odd talk here and there, and I wrote some stuff while I was at home. Uh, and then when I left for the South Pole, that was a big chunk. It was three months. But again, in the marketing, I went... I go here and I, I wrote a wage quite openly into it because I was on my own with three children. I wrote a wage into the sponsorship and, and everybody was, it was open and, and, and above board. Uh, and so I said to them, I have got to go away three months. My grand, my mum, mum and your grandma and granddad are coming back and it means I can then be with you all the time. And, and you think about other mothers and fathers that have to work and they can't take their children to school <laughs> and they just to be they bought into it and and they started to regurgitate it which made me feel a little bit bad but i believed in what i was doing i believed in teaching my children and it's not for everybody but it meant for me i i could do these great adventures and be a full-time mum and we're re they're 23 now and i do i have a partner now and a 14 year old and we're really close. And now they look back and they say, it, we didn't even know it was amazing. And now we kind of think it's really amazing. And my daughter, one of them is a Queen Mary. She was doing the, twe the tweets for me this time. So I kind of get them involved on that. But what I taught them was, don't follow my footsteps. Don't think you have to do what I do or do my kind of achievement. I think you have to be brave to follow your footsteps, whatever that is. 
Lucy wants to be a teacher, uh, Rachel's uh, in nursing, Joe, uh, he works at festivals all summer and travels. And I'm proud of them for, not, for actually not, I have to do what mum does, I want to live my life, and their life is theirs. So that's kind of how we've, we've lived it as we've gone up. And I, and I think if you're true to yourself, then I personally believe you are a better mother. And, and, and you've got to look after them as well, but you find a way to do both. That's good, thank you. Thank you for that. I suggest that's a great point to sort of draw the formal part of the, the evening to a, to a close. I'm delighted that Anne will be staying for a, a short Anywhere. while, you know, joining us for drinks um, afterwards as well. And everybody, of course, invited to the drinks. There'll be an opportunity to, to catch Anne and, and ask questions as well. But before we, before we actually sort of um, head downstairs for the drinks, I'd just like to, to say thanks to, to a number of people for, for tonight. Firstly, of course, thanks to our Chancellor, David Eustace, for um, initiating the Chancellor Talk series and for actually hosting, hosting the evenings. I think he set out in, 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 in putting together the, the, these events to bring to the university truly inspirational speakers who would make us all think and look at life a little bit differently. And I think, certainly, I think, you know, tonight's speaker has, has done exactly that. So thank you to, to, um, to David for, for hosting these events and creating such interesting and, and inspiring events for our students, for our staff, and for friends of the university. So thank you, David. Thank you also to everybody behind the scenes who's made the event possible tonight. And there's too many people to mention individually, but it really was an example of actually a team effort to put on the, the event this evening and make it such a success. And I'm sure everybody would uh, echo me, my, my, my comments in, uh, on that. Thank you to you all for coming as well and for supporting the event. And it's great to see such a, such a great turnout um, this evening. And um, at the start, David talked about um, hoping every one of us would take something away from this evening and something positive that perhaps inspiring make us, make us think a little bit differently. And I know, certainly speaking for myself, and again, I'm sure for everybody else, we've done exactly that. I'm just a bit overwhelmed by the number of things I'm, I'm digesting and taking away, but genuinely, genuinely inspiring. And of course, most importantly, thanks to, to Anne for, for the, um, for the what is, you know, I'm genuinely struggling for the words, really, because you know, awe-inspiring doesn't, doesn't seem to begin to do justice to what, um, what you've, you've you know, described tonight and, and captured tonight, but really, truly thought-provoking and, and actually hugely enjoyable uh, lecture as well. And, um, you know, the, the sort of thoughts that I have a huge amount personally digest put around teamwork, around trust, around determination, dealing with setback, ambition, dealing with fear, and, and, and just having belief, and actually that daring to dream big and having the conviction, the determination to turn a dream into a reality. And I just think it's, it's, it's sort of mind-blowing and, and awesome. But I really kind of understand now the comment that I think Prince Charles made about um, a wonderful example of determination and true British grit. So thank you, Anne, for a really enjoyable and inspiring lecture. Thank you all for coming. Please do come and join us down, downstairs tonight. And... Um, Good night, everybody. And also, please do join the Facebook page for the, for the um, talk series. And very much look forward to, to in due course, further, further talks in the series. So thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thank